Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Don't turn away when trouble comes. Give me your ear, and when I call, Lord, answer me soon. I bones disappear like smoke. My bones burn away like fire. Your heart is withered like a dead grass, and I just can't eat. And I cry till I'm just skin and bones. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Don't turn away when trouble comes. Give me your call, Lord, answer me soon. Like a pelican in the wild, or an owl in deserted rooms, or like a sparrow I sit alone, and my thoughts make fun all who hate me use my name as a curse. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Don't turn away when trouble comes. Give me your ear. When I call, Lord, answer me soon. I eat ashes instead of bread, and mingle my tears with drink. You leave me all alone in your wrath, like a shadow, Lord. For my days gone, and I wither like grass. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Don't turn away when trouble comes. Give me your ear. When I call, Lord, answer me soon. Good morning, Geneva College. Oh my goodness. You know, I'm away for one week, and you are still just as bad as saying good morning as you were for the last year and a half. Um, it's, been a, it's a gift to be back with you all. Um, I, I want to thank you all for picking on me all week and letting me know that I wasn't in chapel. I just want to let you know that I will return the favor when I don't see you in chapel week 13 or 14 or 15. Just remember that. Just remember that. <sighs> a couple announcements for this morning. Wellness Wednesday is today from 3.30 to 5.30. I'm pretty sure where's Matt at. Oh, there's Elijah. In, in Sky Lounge? Okay, it's in Sky Lounge. Perfect. Another big announcement is something that is coming back after the pandemic. This is year one back for Jubilee. Jubilee, one person. Yeah, I'm excited for that. And she's never been to Jubilee, so that's good to know. 
Jubilee is a Christian conference where thousands of students come from around the country to hear about the good news of Jesus in Pittsburgh. It's happening this February, 17 to 19. We're taking a big group of students down, and Dean Swank has presented a challenge to us. Jubilee is usually like $300 a person. To sign up for Jubilee, you need to put $50 down, and the dean said if we get over 50 students to go to Jubilee, she's going to pay for our hotels. We're halfway there, so we need at least 25 more people so we can uh, rob the dean of all that money of hers. So please sign up for Jubilee. If you have questions about that, we'll have more information as we go forward. But if you have questions, please come talk to me. All right. First, first time of the semester, Kendall Shaporka is calling me. Everybody pull out your phones. Come on. I know you missed me. I know you missed this. Come on. No one's going to do it. No one's going to do it. You're not doing it. It's because you have all left your phones at home. Good job, everyone. Alex Montgomery, Olivia, it's good to see you all. Let's put those things away. You don't need them. I was talking to someone this morning, and uh, I was like, aren't you excited for chapel this morning? Blah, 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 blah. And he's like, oh, I, I, I got to do some homework. And I said, oh, what do you mean you got to do some homework? He said, I got to do some homework. And I said, you best believe if I see you on that computer, I will come find you. You know who you are. Be an example for the rest of us. Get off the computer. All right. Let's take a moment of silence and become aware of the Spirit's presence in this place. God, it is good to be together this morning. It's good when your people gather to hear your word and join together in community. God, may you meet all of us in this moment where we are, recognizing that some of us come in with heavy sorrow and burden, some of us with great joy, and some of us with uh, some homework to do. Lord, we, we trust that you see us and you know us and you long to be with us here. God, we love you and we thank you and we pray that you might bless our time together for your glory and our good. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Good morning. In our text this morning, we find that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the true Messiah for whom his people had long awaited. Uh, but he has to do some serious correction in terms of uh, what that actually means and in terms of their expectations, <laughs> as we'll see. But he does present himself as not just a savior, but the only true savior. Can you sense the gravity of what I'm saying? Uh, he doesn't just save, but he saves to the uttermost. He is the only king worthy of all our praise. He is the fulfillment of everything Solomon writes in Psalm 72 of the true king. So I invite all voices to stand and sing together Psalm 72 E. Do, 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 do. He will save the me when they call. Save the boy and those who have no help. He has pity on the poor and weak. And he saves the lives of those in need from oppression. Oh, he redeems their lives and buys them back. And oppression. Oh, all their life is precious in his sight. May he live and hold no sheep was from then be given as a gift to him. Israel be blessed. Bless 
All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin Donaldson, the RD of Young Hall, and behind me, the uh, RA. So we are the Res Life staff of Young Hall. Yeah, let's go. I'll take that. I'll take that. All right. So I'm going to lead you this morning in the Nicene Creed. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father, through whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, he, he suffered, suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life in the world to come. Amen. All right, now you can go to the back of your bulletin, and we're going to do the responsive reading. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, guys. Have a great chapel. It's good that we gather together. Let's join our hearts and minds in prayer. Our great and mighty God, we thank you for this time together, an opportunity where we as a community of believers can come to glorify your name. We're grateful for all you've done for us. We're reminded of all that you would have us do Lord, we just let too many things get in the way of our responsibilities. Help us to understand what we need to do and to dedicate ourselves and our time to meeting our obligations. This is very difficult for us, Lord, because we let trivial things interfere with our sense of duty. We find excuses to not do what we should be doing. And yet we easily talk ourselves into doing that which should not be devoted to our time and energy. Lord, 
Help us to recommit to those things that are important and to delegate our time and energy and prepare for our classes each and every day. Lord, the first commandment is to love you with all our heart and mind and soul. Yet personally, we can't even find the time to even come to you in prayer. Help us to understand that when we call on you, there is never a busy signal. You find behind your willingness to listen and then help us to patiently wait for your answer. Lord, you've commanded us to love one another, to love our neighbor, but instead of trying to nurture our relationships, we demand what we want and we believe we're always right. Help us to take the time to listen and to understand that it's good to have friends and peer support. We thank you for this college and the opportunities to grow as a kingdom for your will. May this time during this chapel allow us to come to a greater understanding of what you would have us do to further your kingdom here. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we've already seen in the response of reading, Jesus takes up a very interesting question. What is true bread? What is true manna? Right? That was the image that God gave his people throughout the Old and New Testaments. It's a very rich question. One of the richest Bible studies I've ever done is trace, doing a study of manna and how it's talked about and used. Uh, a good starting place, perhaps, is Deuteronomy, where Moses declares to Israel what they should have learned through their experience with manna. That man does not live by bread alone, but by God's word. Every part of God's word, right? And Jesus doubles down on this saying, I, he's saying, I am the word. I am the true bread. So the more we obsess over God's word, the more we find Jesus. We believe that very deeply here at Geneva. So today we're going to sing Psalm 19b because it extols the blessings of knowing God's word. So I would, I would ask you to, 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 to look and see as we sing, how does God's word shape our lives when we really look into it? All right. There's a blessing in pretty much every single line. So I invite every voice to stand and sing and extol God's word. The Lord's most perfect love will make the soul revive. The Lord's word which is faith, the simple-minded wise, the precepts of the Lord are right and fill the heart with great delight. The Lord's love and is pure, and like the eyes to see, fear of the Lord is clean, at last eternally, the judgments of the
I'm way too short for that, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> thanks. Some of you may know me. I'm Sarah Detrow. I'm the manager at the Campus Bookstore here. Um, I'm honored to have this time with you um, and share about um, things that God has done to make himself known to me at different times in my life. I'm going to share this verse with you. It's, it's really important to me. Um, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. That's Psalm 66, 1 and 2. There has never been a time in my life where I have not known of the Lord. Um, I think I can say with pretty great confidence there's never been a time in my life where someone would have questioned um, if I had a relationship with Jesus or not. There was a time in my life when I felt so far away from him that I questioned my faith quite a bit. I had all of these thoughts of doubt and just all those other things um, that I allowed Satan to tell me. Have you ever been in, in a place like that in your life where you, know, you, might have, you might have thought, well, that's it. I've really done it. Um, I've done it now. Without going into great detail, I do want to share a personal uh, part of my story, a very personal part of my life with you. Um, at the age of 18, some of you know, um, I had my first child, and that was the result of a very abusive situation. I remember having a lot of thoughts during that pregnancy. Um, and I can't even begin to tell you how terrified I was. But it is with great confidence that I can say that life was the only option for myself concerning this baby. That is a topic that I'm very, very passionate about. Ask anyone. I get a little extreme sometimes. Um, but even before, um, even before becoming a mother so young, uh, pro-life movement was a very big part of my life growing up. My parents instilled that in me. Um, I did think things, though, like, what, what will happen to me and this baby? Will my family want anything to do with us? Will I ever go on to college? Will I ever be a normal adult? Um, how will I provide? Um, here's another verse. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans, from Romans 8. Um, there were many people and different situations God just randomly happened to put in my life um, during this time to remind me of this, to remind me of the fact that nothing could separate me from his love. One of the things he used during that dark time was, believe it or not, the start of my college career. Oh which did start back in 2008. Um, that was something that consumed a lot of my time, as it should. You should always be concentrating on everything to do with your college career. Um, <laughs> um, but I didn't quite graduate in the traditional time frame. Um, a lot happened during that time of taking college classes, um, baby born. I began to work full time and just chose uh, to work on um, parenting and repairing relationships and my relationship with the Lord. So I decided to discontinue college classes for a time. Um, and God really did a lot in that time, um, really brought me even closer to my very Italian family <laughs> than I already was. Um, everyone supported me. My parents supported me in a way that I can't really describe. Um, that included many late nights of, yes, very Italian family, so lots of talking passionately, um, but also praying, um, really interceding on my behalf and my baby's behalf. Um, I am forever thankful for them and the strong relationships that they individually have with the Lord um, that really helped me get to where I am today, um, and also my siblings, because I could have never navigated that part of my life without them either. Anyway, um, to keep things short, I'm happy to sit down with anyone who wants to know more, um, but I'm going to fast forward a good bit. 
going to marry a man who deeply loved the Lord, me and our toddler. We got married right before his senior year, so <laughs> a little untraditional, like August 13th, and then classes started the 29th, so it's a little, a little crazy, but it all worked out. Um, and then fast forward some more. Um, in 2018, the Lord made it clear I was to return to college uh, 10 years later. Um, I was able to begin the adult completion program here at Geneva. And once again, um, the Lord gave me that overwhelming peace that he was there. He was there with our children as I began that journey. Um, as you know, college can be stressful. Um, and just add life and children, and it's just even more stressful. I will say, stress is stress. Whatever season of life you're in, that is, that's, that's individual to your situation. Um, but God gets all the glory even for that. My relationship that I have with him, the family he's given me, we now have four children. <laughs> um, my wonderful husband, my incredible church family, uh, my job here, um, and the wonderful company I work for that so happens to be right here um, within the Geneva community. So thankful. Um, God allowed me to see him in even all of that. Um, every single time I started to become fearful, um, pregnancy, um, marriage, moving out of state, a new job while I still have little kids, just all of those things, um, God was there, made himself so clear that it just wasn't a question on what I should be doing. Um, he was there during those dark times of self-hatred, fear, the nights where I felt unworthy of his love or anyone else's, um, or on a lighter note, when I really didn't feel like writing that paper or studying for that exam. He was even there in many different, <laughs> sorry. Um, he's just always been there. And I'm just going to end with this um, from Romans 11, uh, 36. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. We are so thankful that God pursues us with his love. Good morning, Geneva. Happy New Year to you. Hope your New Year's resolutions are still going strong. I look forward to spending 2023 with you again. And uh, well, not again for 2023, but this year, I'm looking forward to spending with you. Uh, we're continuing our working our way through the book of John, and we are in chapter six. In this chapter, we see a big transition. We see the rise and fall of the popularity of Jesus. His popularity actually peaks in the middle of this chapter with the feeding of the 5,000. The people after that love him so much that they tried to drag him to Jerusalem and make him their king. But then, over the course of the rest of the chapter, uh, which covers about a 24-hour period, most of his uh, disciples actually turn away from him and no longer follow him. Well, you have to ask, what happened in the middle of this chapter? Well, it all has to do with eating bread. You wouldn't think that eating bread would be so controversial, but that's what caused so many people to fall away. We just read in verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and then I'm going to read uh, from verse 47. It says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. But this is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This is God's word. May we feast on it by faith. Let's say that you are about to get married. And you're very excited, and I come up to you, and I congratulate you for your engagement, and I say, so what are you looking forward to the most about getting married? And you say, well, that is so easy. The reason why I'm getting married is because I want someone to make breakfast for me every day. And you start to talk about how hard breakfast has been in your life, and how some days you even go without breakfast, and if you do manage to scrape breakfast together, it's just cold cereal. And you miss having that warm, home-cooked breakfast. And so, logical conclusion is, get married. 
it quickly becomes apparent that you don't actually care about the person you're getting married to. You just want breakfast. I would hope you'd all agree with me that this would be perhaps the dumbest reason in the world to get married, just so that you could have breakfast, at least one of the dumbest. Breakfast is not, or marriage is not about breakfast, it's about a relationship. Well, basically, this is what was happening in this chapter. Jesus uh, has never been more popular than he is in this chapter. It becomes clear, though, that the only reason why so many people follow him is because he gave them free food. He knows the way to people's hearts. Free food. He knows the way to college students' hearts. Free food. You know, on one level, you have to admire these people. They've traveled miles and miles to follow Jesus. They go back and, uh, Jesus goes uh, back and forth across the Sea of Galilee. They are very highly motivated to follow him, and so they either boat on after him or they walk around the sea to, to follow him. The problem is that although they're highly motivated, they're following him for all the wrong reasons. And so in verse 26, after this great um, miracle of providing food for thousands of people, he, Jesus says, you follow me because I, I gave you bread to eat. I gave you food. They were so impressed by this miracle and other miracles that they wanted to make Jesus king. And they wanted, him to, wanted to make him king because they thought Jesus would provide breakfast for them every day. He'll heal their diseases. He'll uh, do what they want him to do. He, he's a very useful man to have around. So to make my life easier, let's follow him. Just like there are lots of bad reasons to get married, there are also lots of bad reasons to follow Jesus. Here's what I want you to get out of this passage this morning. Don't follow Jesus because of what he can give you, but follow Jesus because he gives you himself. Don't follow Jesus so that you can get something that you really want. Follow Jesus because he is the one you really want. Jesus is the bread of life. Be joyfully satisfied in him and you will never be hungry again. This section of the chapter follows three miracles. The first miracle is the feeding of the 5,000. We know it as the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus takes a single meal of five dinner rolls and a couple of fish, and he miraculously feeds 10 to 15,000 people. The second miracle is that he walks on water. The disciples are caught in the middle of a storm, in the middle of a lake, a bad place to be, and Jesus walks out to them on the water. The third miracle is that when Jesus gets into the boat with them, that raging storm becomes miraculously calmed, and they immediately arrive at their destination without delay. These three miracles obviously display the power of Jesus. They testify about who he is. But instead of falling in love with Jesus, the people fall in love with what Jesus can do and what they, he can give them. We should follow this guy because he's going to give us food. He'll heal our diseases. They delighted not in Jesus, but in what Jesus could give them. They wanted the product, not the person. There are lots of us here who want to see Jesus do miracles in our lives. We want Jesus to do amazing things for us. But I'm afraid what so often resides in our hearts is that we don't really want Jesus. We just want what he can give us. And rather than wanting Jesus, we're just using him to get what we really want. Jesus exposes this wrong reason for following him. Jesus goes back and forth across the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, and the crowds were very uh, committed to following him. They tracked him down, finally, at the town of Capernaum. They, uh, and Jesus said to him, You're seeking me not because you saw a sign, but because you ate the bread. You were hungry, and I fed you, and that's why you're following me. You think I'm going to give you breakfast every day. What he's saying is, you don't really care about me, you just want what I can give you. Maybe you think Jesus is the one who's going to calm your storm, or heal your body, or give you good grades, or that good job, or give you that relationship that you so desperately want. But if that's all the reason why you want Jesus, then you're doing the same thing these people are doing. It's easy to follow Jesus just because you think he'll give you what you want, rather than seeing that he is who you want. Do you see how easy it is to place the emphasis not on the person, but on the product? 
Jesus, in this case, simply turns into a tool that we use to get what we want. So if you're following Jesus because of what he can give you, because he'll give you food or calm your storms, then you're just like that crazy person who says, uh, I want to get married because I, I, I want a good cooked breakfast. If that's why you're following Jesus, then you're missing the point. I look back on my own life, and throughout the various seasons of my life, I notice how often I followed God for the wrong reasons. There are many times where I thought that if I followed God, if I gave my life, if I did this for Him, if I did enough of these things, then He would give me what I really want. And it slowly revealed to me that I'm uh, pursuing God to get what I want rather than pursuing God because I want Him. This is a critical difference. By the end of this chapter, those who were motivated to follow Jesus because of the product, they actually end up turning away from him because they didn't like what he had to say. They realized that he wasn't going to just do what they wanted him to do, and so they turned away. They didn't want him. They just wanted what he could give. When he didn't give what he, they wanted, then there was no reason to follow him. This is an important lesson for you to learn in your own faith. And we learn this progressively in our lives. Instead of seeing God as the one who can give you what you want, begin to see him as the one you actually want. And that he will satisfy you. And that he's more than enough. And that he is your nourishment for this journey. Now Jesus responds to this misguided motivation by saying, I am the bread of life. You're missing the whole point. I am the bread of life. In fact, this is such an important concept that Jesus repeats it quite a few times. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. Verse 41, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Verse 51, I am the living bread. He repeats himself quite a few times, which means you should realize that this is very important. This is something you need to understand. So you have to understand, you have to wrestle with what does he mean that I, when he says I am the bread of life. I'm going to point out four important things to understand from this phrase, that Jesus is the bread of life. First, Jesus needs to be the one that I want. Jesus needs to be the one that I want. As I said earlier, Jesus was exposing the misguided motivation of the crowds. Don't follow me because I can fill your stomachs right now, but follow me because I am your food. I will satisfy you. Don't set your hearts on what I give you, but set your hearts on me. Jesus needs to be the one you want. Second thing, Jesus is the one who will satisfy me. Jesus is the one who will satisfy me. Just like bread satisfies our hunger, so Jesus satisfies our soul. The greatest need in your life is not, the, uh, is not to find relief from the occasional physical hunger that you experience, or getting the right job, or being in the right relationship, but your greatest spiritual, uh, your greatest need is spiritual. Your greatest need is for Him. We were all born dead in our sin, and we need Jesus to forgive. We were born enemies of God, and we need Jesus to reconcile us to God. We were born orphans, and we need Jesus to adopt us into the family of God. Only Jesus can satisfy your greatest need. Along with all those needs, you were born with great yearnings and desires, and many of you spend your lives trying to fill those yearnings and desires with everything that the world offers. But you'll find that it never actually satisfies. Nothing fills that inward void. But Jesus is the bread of life, and he provides, satisfies your greatest longing. He forgives your sins, reconciles you to the living God, and he alone will satisfy your soul. Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician, said it rightly. There is in every person a craving that man tries in vain to fill with everything around him. But nothing works. Because that infinite abyss within us can only be filled with an infinite being. Namely, God. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy the craving of your soul. Jesus satisfies. 
The third thing that Jesus is teaching us by saying, I am the bread of life, he's teaching us that Jesus is more than enough for me. More than enough for me. When Jesus calls himself the bread of life, uh, he references two miracles. One miracle is the, is the miracle that happened just the day before when he fed um, 10 to 15,000 people with a few rolls and some fish. And after everyone ate their fill, he sent his disciples, his 12, to gather the leftovers. And when they were done gathering, they had 12 basketfuls of leftovers. What's the point of that? Why have leftovers? The point was that he provided far more than enough. The other miracle that Jesus references is when God miraculously feeds the Israelites as they're wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. God caused the manna to form on the ground and everyone gathered as much as they could eat and there was still a lot left over. Again, the point is, God provided far more than enough. When Jesus said that I am the bread of life, he's saying I, I am far more than enough for you. You don't need me plus something else or plus what other people offer. I give you more than enough. And it's in this context that he says, if you eat the, this bread, you will not hunger again. You, not, you shall not thirst again. Because I'm more than enough for you. And then the fourth thing that Jesus is telling us when he claims to be the bread of life Jesus is your strength for the journey. Jesus is my strength for the journey. The Israelites walked through the desert for 40 years, a very long time. Without manna, they wouldn't have made it a year, let alone 40. The manna was their nourishment for the journey. When the crowds came to Jesus in John 6, they traveled six miles perhaps to get to him that day and then they had to travel that same amount to get back home they needed nourishment and so he provided a meal for them the bread was their nourishment for the journey these miracles symbolize the display that jesus in the midst of our journey through the valley of the shadow of death jesus is the strength and nourishment that we need that he's the one who gets us through jesus is your nourishment and if you don't have jesus you're not going to survive this life you're not going to survive your trials and you most definitely won't survive your death. If you want nourishment, we all need nourishment for this journey. If you want the proper nourishment, then you need Jesus. He must be your daily bread, the source of your strength. Jesus is the bread of life. Don't follow him because he can give you physical bread. Follow him because he is your bread. He is the one... He needs to be the one that you want. He's the only one who can satisfy you. He's more than enough. And he is your strength for the journey. So Jesus said, I am the bread of life and this bread will fill you eternally. You won't hunger or thirst. And the crowd responded to him and, and said, that sounds great. So how do we get this bread that you're talking about? What do we have to do to get this bread? Jesus answered very clearly, verse 29, the only work that God requires of you is to believe in him whom he has sent. To believe in Jesus. If you want this bread, if you want Jesus to be your bread, to provide for you, to satisfy you, to be more than enough for you, to be your, your strength in this journey, then you must believe. You surrender your life to him. You follow him by faith. You turn away from those sins that you've chased after for so long. You believe in him. He will satisfy you forever. We all know that marriage is way more than just having a hot breakfast every day. It's a relationship. We can easily spot some misguided motivations for marriage, but yet it's all too easy to fall into this way of thinking when it comes to Jesus. Do you follow Jesus because of what he might be able to give to you? Or do you follow Jesus because he gives you himself? This relationship is so much more than just getting what you want. It's getting God. Deep friendship, satisfaction, intimacy that compares to nothing else in this world. That he knows you and you know him. Follow Jesus. Not because he'll give you bread. But follow Jesus because he is 
the bread. Be joyfully satisfied in him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son to be the bread that comes from heaven. To be the living bread, the bread of life, the one who finally and fully satisfied us. Lord Jesus, you are the bread of life. You will satisfy us. You are more than enough. You are our strength in this journey, and we need you more than anything. You are so gracious to provide yourself for us. So uproot the misguided motivations that so easily linger in our hearts. Don't let us follow you because of what you can give us, but let us follow you because you give us yourself. Let us enjoy you and enjoy this friendship and this intimacy more and more each day that every storm would help us to know you better and better as the bread of life. You've graciously and willingly and lovingly provided for us. And so we praise you and thank you forever. And together we say, amen. Praise